Poor regulation can lead to environmental and financial disasters. That's the key point that I want to focus on in this lecture in relation to water management particularly. So in this lecture, we're moving on from nature conservation and vegetation management. Last week, you recall, we looked at particularly vegetation management and saw that it had been an incredibly complicated, uh, controversial and political component of the overall regulatory system very, very difficult to deal with and very political. Water management is similar in many ways because vegetation management is really fundamental to how particularly farmers can, what they can do and can't do on their land. Water management similarly is fundamental to a lot of land development. And because we had a couple of centuries with very little regulation of vegetation management and water management, basically, people could pretty well use what they wanted and it became seen as a right if you owned land that you could clear trees and you could also take whatever water you wanted. And it's only really in the last 20, 30 years that the, the cumulative impacts of that sort of unregulated approach have really come home and we've seen massive sort of problems with associated with vegetation management and water management then trying to regulate them within a culture that sort of was anti-regulation for those issues has become really, really hard. So water management is an important part of the overall regulatory system. I'm going to deal very briefly linking it back to the planning system and the simple aspects of when you need a development approval. But what I want to do in this lecture is particularly, we've, we've looked at the development assessment system in earlier lectures, and I don't want to rehash over that. I want to paint a broader picture and look at wider water management issues, and particularly looking at a large dam called the Paradise Dam. Also going to touch on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and particularly want to look at construction of dams, control of river flow and extraction from water courses. So those big picture issues that you don't tend to deal with on a day to day level in, you know, in working in Queensland, unless you're working in the water management sector, particularly. But, you know, for your normal planner or your normal environmental manager, they're not issues that you tend to work with on a day to day level. They're still important, though, for the overall context. So I want to touch on, well, I want to focus on them, sink our teeth into them for the, the, those broader lessons. In the second half of the lecture, I'm going to cover fisheries laws and look at different components of it. Again, linking back in some aspects to the planning system, but also looking to wider fisheries um, issues. And then cultural heritage is the final component of this lecture. And water management and fisheries have logical connection um, cultural heritage are brought into this lecture because um, because there's only 13 lectures in the overall course. Uh, not every important topic can have its own lecture, so I brought in cultural heritage. It's an important component of the regulatory system. There's two components of it, the um, non-Indigenous um, cultural heritage, things like the Queensland Heritage List, buildings and those sorts of things that have heritage values. But then there's also really important issues associated with Indigenous cultural heritage, so the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and uh, it related to that are issues around native title. So it's not a big focus of this course, but I want to give it uh, an emphasis in this lecture. So they're the three components of this lecture. I just wanted to link first back into the systems that we've already covered in earlier lectures to just deal with the fact that for some development involving water extraction you will need a development approval under the planning act and you will also need a water license under the water act so there's two components often for development that requires the extraction of water that's the water entitlement so that is um, an, an approval process under the Water Act for interfering with surface water, overland flow water or underground water. And I'm not going to deal with that in detail. Um, it's a, you know, it's a system that's that's there. Um, in comparison to the development approval system under the Planning Act, it's pretty simple. If you recognize that you need a, a water license, then, you know, you go and get it. Um, 
you also will often require a development approval under the Planning Act for a range of operational works that involve waterway barriers or taking of water. So just to link back into the previous uh, lectures. So this first is the water license. You can get more information uh, about that from the state government website. I put the link into the slides. So if you're interested in water licenses, you can go and have a look at you know, those application processes. There's a, um, a power to involve moratorium notices and it's linked in with water plans. It's a, it's a part of a larger framework for water planning in Queensland. And you also will often require a development approval under the Planning Act for operational works that involve waterway barriers or taking of water. So, for instance, if you want to um, build a small um, dam or weir to capture water, say you're a property owner and you want to capture overland flow or put a little weir in a creek to capture and essentially make a storage area for water, you will typically require an approval for that um, construction. So you'd have a farm, there's no material change of use because you're, you're still operating as a farm, but it is works that affects the um, land and so it comes within the operational works component of development and as with other forms of development, you know that there's the triggers at the state government level under the um, planning regulations. So here's just a couple of examples of them. So this is from Schedule 10. There's a trigger for operational works that is constructing or raising water, waterway barriers. So think of something like a small um, earthen embankment, a, a small dam in a creek uh, or, or the like. That's uh, the sort of thing that will trigger accessible development and approval. And similarly, uh, taking of water can that involves operational works. So if you want to install a pump, or something like that to pull water out of a uh, creek um, or a river, typically that will also require or trigger uh, development approval requirements. Um, so this is the water related development aspects under the planning regulations. So we've already dealt with those, you know, we've dealt with the planning system. So water and taking of water and the activities associated with constructing barriers in waterways and pumps to extract water those things can trigger development assessment. But what I want to do with this lecture is go wider than that, the sort of technical stuff that we've already dealt with. And I really want to use this focus in this lecture on, uh, on water um, to paint a bigger picture about the long-term and highly complex nature of environmental problems and the laws that regulate them. The importance of monitoring requirements and approval conditions and the importance of yeah, courage and doing what you know is right regardless of who's paying you. So that's the wider thing I want to move to in this lecture and I want to do it through an example of the Paradise Dam. In previous lectures I've made the point that environmental leg legislation might be partly symbolic, designed to satisfy international obligations or to quiet public interest groups with the tacit understanding between government and regulators of under enforcement. So if you look at our water laws, you'll see a lot of emphasis on sustainable use, sustainability. It's just written through the whole um, framework. So those things are important. And it's been an important shift in the last 20 years to just moving from just taking any water pretty well that was there and over extraction of water to a real emphasis on sustainability. The point I want to make though is there's still major problems with the implementation of that and I want to do that by looking at a large dam that was built in southeast Queensland or um, in the Bundaberg region rather than southeast Queensland uh, in the about 15 years ago. So I'll start with this picture. This is a picture of the um, Burnett River in an area that was later flooded by a large dam. So this picture was taken in 2003. You can see uh, at this time the, the river was um, slow flowing, fairly shallow, wide, uh, so great habitat for fish. And um, this is a little bit downstream of that previous image. This is again from 2003 
and you can see here the river, uh, the Burnett River uh, is wide. You can see it's quite shallow and slow flowing. So the river can have massive floods and I'll show you some imagery of some floods in a moment. But if you just think about this uh, image in, in at a time when the river flow is fairly low, it's great habitat for fish. So fish can swim upstream quite easily against the gentle current. Um, there's large areas for fish to move. So enormous amount of fish habitat in this area. So fish moving up from the ocean. Uh, a lot of fish like barramundi um, and others swim up, um, breed in the um, upper reaches of water catchments like this and then return to the ocean. So these sorts of areas are not just important for you know, the, the beauty of looking at a, a lovely river. They're also critical for uh, fisheries resources uh, in coastal areas. So this is another image from 2003. Uh, focusing in, you can see um, the river's fairly low. Um, it's obviously slow flowing at this point. So this is really good habitat for fish to move upstream. So exactly where this picture was taken, uh, there is now a massive uh, concrete um, dam has been constructed and I'm going to show you images of that. So just we're going from this uh, 15 years ago, which is a highly connected, great fish habitat to um, this. So this is a little bit of footage uh, taken in 2009 looking, uh, panning across the Paradise Dam. So that's exactly where that previous picture was taken. There is now a 40 meter high dam called the Paradise Dam. It was named after a, um, a gold rush town that no longer exists called Paradise. And it's quite ironic that the dam is called um, Paradise Dam. It was the government tr had an idea of naming it the Burnett River Dam at one stage, but Paradise Dam was the name that stuck. So this dam was proposed um, in 2001, 2000, 2001. It, was, it came out of an election promise by Peter Beattie um, and it was built in 2003 to 2005. It had massive impacts on the river. So if we summarize some of the major impacts of the dam, it led to the destruction and flooding of 40 kilometers of the river for the dam wall and the reservoir. There were major changes in the downstream flow regime and it's become a major barrier for fish passage and also a major source of fish mortality on the spillway. So I'm going to unpack each of those just to understand how a major dam like this impacts on a river. And as part of the wider context, Paradise Dam is one of 47 major dams in Queensland, that is dams with over 10,000 megalitre capacity. It's the 10th largest dam in Queensland by storage capacity or was. I'm going to focus in on that area around um, Bundaberg. So this is um, just inland from Fraser Island. So you can see Bundaberg there marked on the map and the general location of the Paradise Dam. So the Burnett River, it's a big catchment. So this map is taken from the Burnett Basin plan area. So this is within the water planning framework in Queensland. There are water plans and this is the area that's covered by the Burnett Basin uh, water plan. So you can see there in that image, the Paradise Dam is sort of midway in the river. Upstream from it, there's a whole heap of big dams and weirs um, and downstream of it as well. There's also a whole range of dams and weirs and barrages. So. If I just go to another image, I'm going to show you some images of a fish called a lungfish. And it's a really um, old um, fish in the fossil record. It's been around for about 400 million years. And it was found in two rivers in Queensland, uh, one of them being the Burnett River. And its core habitat is shown in that image. So if I just go back, um, this is the overall Burnett Basin and then so this is the Burnett Basin but the red um, line shows the major part of the river the sort of 
slower flowing wide part of the river in the lower reaches and the Paradise Dam was located smack bang in the middle of its habitat, its core habitat. So here's an image of a lungfish. So this is, and by the way, this is the best looking picture you'll see of a lungfish. They're prehistoric um, fish. They, you might think that they're not that cute to look at. So here's a lungfish uh, on the ground and it's, uh, yeah, it's a very old um, fish. It's called a lungfish because it has um, rudimentary lungs. So it's able to um, breathe air through lungs as well as through its gills. And it's, yeah, that's unusual for fish. Fish normally breathe just underwater with their gills and they're taking oxygen from the water um, and then uh, taking it into their blood. Whereas lungfish have that ability to breathe through gills they can also breathe through lungs. So they were found um, by Europeans uh, about a century ago and made protected fish very early on because of their limit, dis, limited distribution. So this dam was to be located, was proposed to be located right in the middle of their core habitat on the Burnett River. So one of only two rivers with them. So the impacts on lungfish was a, um, an issue that the government in proposing and assessing the dam had to consider and this is the dam that they were proposing you can just see it in outline it's i'll just change that a bit so you can see here the dam so those pictures that i showed you before looking in at the burnett river they were taken right where this dam wall is now constructed and then the blue line shows where the dam reservoir gets up to. So it's it's not a very good location for a dam. It's it's quite shallow. Um, this is an image of the dam taken recently. So you can see the dam wall um, and the reservoir stretching up. So that's looking west and the water being released. So here's the water outlet. So the basic components of the dam are um, there's a water outlet here. So that's for release of water downstream um, during normal operations. In floods, um, water can go over the spillway. So the Burnett River has massive floods and if water is coming down at a greater rate than it can be released through the water outlet, then it is intended, the, the dam is designed that it can spill over the spillway. So here's uh, an image from um, the west looking towards the dam wall and you can see the dam spillway there. I'm going to talk and show you a few images of the outlet works which are that sort of building there on the right of the image. So you can see the spillway. So that's the area where water is meant to in a massive flood or any flood that gets beyond, gets once the dam gets full that um, the dam can be uh, Water just doesn't build up and go around the sides of the dam. There's a um, specific way that water is meant to be released. So here's just a slightly different image of that. So here's the water uh, intake uh, where water, so in a normal operation, water goes, is basically taken in here and then released um, down um, stream via the um, uh, outlet works. So Here's just a little a slightly different view. You can see the water going down there, down the Burnett River. So I'm going to focus in on those outlet works. So water comes in here um, and there's grills to stop um, fish and other things getting in there or supposed to stop them. Um, so water goes in there when it's to be released. As part of the... so. This dam going right in the middle of this major river with not only lungfish, but barramundi, a whole range of um, fish that are important for fisheries. So a lot of fish swim up the river, breed in the upper catchment and then return to the ocean. So in building this dam in 2000, the early 2000s, because of the impacts on fisheries, the state government in proposing it put forward um, a proposal to have um, fish transfer devices installed in the dam. And as, a, as a massive undertaking because 
this dam is so tall, you can't just have fish ladders. You know, I'm sure you've seen them in um, documentaries or, or the like where, you know, like salmon sort of leaping up through cascading water going down through a little fish ladder. Well, for a massive dam like this, it's too high for fish ladders to work. So what the um, government proposed was to build fish transfer devices to go down and to go up. Now, this is the intake for the downstream fishway. Now, can anyone, looking at that image, can anyone see a minor problem for fish uh, accessing the fishway? Yeah, they can't fly. Yeah, they can't fly. <laughs> so here's the bottom of the fishway and here's the water. Okay, so lungfish are amazing fish, but they are not known. I'm going to draw you a lungfish here. Here's a lungfish and here's it with its wings. Okay, so that's an imaginary lungfish. Um, lungfish don't have wings. Uh, they can't jump. So the fishway, this image was taken in 2008. So the dam had been built in 2005 and filled up and uh, it took years for the water to get to the level where the fish way would even work. And I, um, in about 2008, I was contacted by a conservation group um, to be involved in litigation about the lack of operation of these fishways. Really and it led to a major case in the federal court that I'll mention at the end of this um, where essentially we challenged the operation of the fishways and yeah, yeah this massive enormous case about the lack of operations and how they weren't effective okay so coming back to um what i was saying so this is an image of the fishway in 2008 when the water level had dropped and you can see um, there's no way that fish can use that Here's an image that shows what was proposed. So it was actually the first time that this was ever ever done on any dam anywhere around the world. Uh, it was proposed uh, basically like similar to a toilet being flushed where fish would swim in to that entrance point and then would go through a pipe uh, and be released beneath um, the dam. So the drop there is about 30 meters. So if you think about that, if you guys have been involved in diving or the like, you know that for every 10 meters of depth, you get one uh, atmosphere of pressure. So there's big changes in pressure uh, in going from the surface um, down there. It's also just a big pipe that's completely black. Uh, so, you know, how can fish find their way through it? Well, first off, how can they find their way in? They're meant to be attracted in by water flowing into it. And then about once an hour, it's basically um, shut off and they release the water and any fish that are in it. But as fish pass through that, they can be injured. You know, you're basically going through this big pipe that's pitch black and potentially banging into the sides, you know, losing an eye. Um, lots of potential injuries in that um, pipe. But that's what was proposed, a big, um, the downstream fishway. So that's to go downstream. Now to go upstream, because fish also needed to be able to get up above the dam, what was proposed was a big lift. And so basically you can see it here. Fish were to um, go in this little slot, again attracted by flowing water, swim up this channel, and they get to a little lift. And in the lift, um, there was a little button um, that said, press here to go up. Uh, and then the fish with, would go over with a little flipper and press the button and then it would go beep, 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 beep and the whole thing would lift up and go over. No, I'm only joking. Um, there wasn't the button. Um, there's no button. Um, but the rest of that is basically true. Basically, they had built a lift to lift the fish over and what you can see there is the lift at the top no button about it was proposed that once an hour it would lift over so this is the called the upstream fish lift uh, and you can see it there that's the it's basically like a small um, sort of mini skip um, that you know about the size of a small car um, it would be filled with water they they run water through it 
and then it would lift once an hour it would lift over the dam wall and on those rails and the intention so here's it so it started yellow it um, this is it after a couple of years of operation um, brown and dry um, wasn't in use at this time because what they found was uh, there were massive problems with getting this to run it constantly broke down it needed a whole heap of sensors it was just very expensive and labor intensive to run it um, so basically they didn't run it um, and uh, there were large, just as the, with the downstream fishways, it took years for it to operate. With the upstream fishway, it also basically wasn't run. So here's another image of the looking down on that hopper. You can see it's filled with water. Um, this image was taken relatively early on. You can tell it's yellow. Sorry, you can tell because it's still yellow. It's got the original paint on it. Um, but also um, later on, they put a cage over the top. Um, you can't really see it in that image, but what they found was fish were jumping out, um, which is kind of a problem when there's a 30 meter, 30 meter um, drop. So here's a diagram of what the hopper was meant to do. So water was, um, would flow out to attract fish in, and then basically it was like a big crab pot. There was a way fish could swim in, but then they, it was difficult for them to swim out. And then once an hour, it was meant to lift over the dam wall and be dropped in the other side and then a little flap on the bottom would open and then they'd lift it out and all the water would drain out and any fish that were in it would also um, drop out. So here's a bit of imagery of the hopper actually working. This is taken in 2009. Um, it was, this imagery was taken as part of that court case and played in the, um, in the court case. So you can see there a bit of water splashes out and then it's just slowed down because now it's turning to being vertical, it gets lifted up. And then I'll just jump forward to the next image. This is Scott Selwood who took this imagery, was this solicitor in the court case. He's panning around, you can see the hopper there at the top of the dam wall. So you can see how high it is, it's about 30 meters, it's come up. And then it goes on this big moving crane. So you know, you've got tons of water in that. You can just see the workplace health and safety issues, the engineering issues with getting this to work. Uh, and to be effective, it's got to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because fish are moving at all times of year. It's not really a seasonal movement, for, particularly for lungfish. So keeping it working was a massive undertaking, very expensive, and it repeatedly broke down. So you can see it moving slowly across there. And then the next image, I think, is it, yeah, getting lowered down into the dam reservoir. And there's a little flap on the bottom that um, is opened and the fish can get out. So this um, fish transfer device, it looks really advanced. And, and as I said, it was the first time this was ever attempted in Australia. And I think globally, it's a big undertaking. Uh, but effectively it failed. It failed because it constantly broke down. It was an engineering nightmare to keep it operating. You can see it being lowered into the water there. Basically they drop it in, then the, the flap opens at the bottom and the fish are let out. That's the theory anyway. So the fish transfer devices, I'll come back to how little they operated, but the other way that fish might move across the dam is to, in floods, go down the spillway. So one of the things that they did with the spillway to save money was instead of building a big um, apron at the bottom, so a lot of, often there's a big apron built at the bottom of dams to slow water down. Uh, but instead of doing that, in this dam they built it with steps. So you can see the, the spillway here, it's massive, it was about 400 meters across. And just focusing in on it, um, here's an image taken close to the spillway. You can see these steps that it's been built with. So the idea was that um, water would be slowed down by these steps um, coming across or over the um, spillway. So that's from an engineering perspective, slowing the water down. Uh, but 
from the perspective of fish transfer, that's a massive problem because any fish and turtles going over the spillway basically run smack into these steps. So fish going over basically have their heads bashed in. So here's a um, small um, flood you can see going across. So any fish going over the spillway basically are falling 30 meters and banging into the concrete. Okay, so this is what the dam looks like in flood. That's the dam in flood in 2010. In 2011 and 2013, there were even larger floods than that. But if you think about that image, you can see the top of the dam um, and then essentially there's the sort of white water about a, two thirds of the way down or about a third of the way down. So again, any that's where the water is hitting these steps and basically um, being pushed out. Again, at this level, any fish or turtles going over the dam basically would hit the dam spillway on the way down and have their heads bashed in. So countless, I mean, with, we're talking about tens of thousands, if not millions of turtles and fish being killed um, on this thing. So it's this massive fish killing device, basically. This is the Paradise Dam in the 2011 floods. So just notice the difference. See here where you've got the white water about a third of the way down. Here the water level is so high that it basically, it doesn't even push the water out that two thirds of the way down. And you can see a massive amount of water moving over. So in 2011, this, this flood basically, um, well, it led to a couple of things. One, it scoured out the bottom of the dam and led to major repair works being required like I think it was about $50 million worth of repair works or 80 million. So a huge amount of work required to repair the dam. It also destroyed the control center uh, and the um, control of the fishways. So they didn't operate for a few years after that. So basically this, this dam was severely damaged by this flood. And here's another image from the 2011 flood uh, you can see the, the catchment and the huge amount of water moving down there. So here's, um, just to show you what happens to the fish, here's a, uh, a dam north of Brisbane called the North Pine Dam. And it's got these um, gates that can be opened to let water out. But at the bottom of the um, spillways, so the spillways here are smooth, but at the bottom of them they've got these, um, uh, yeah, energy dissipated devices that are meant to slow the water down before it rushes downstream. So I'm going to show you some pretty horrible pictures, I'm sorry, of yeah the graphic images of fish injuries. So these are fish, lungfish, that were found downstream of the North Pine Dam in late 2009. And the lungfish had been transferred to this reservoir um, decades ago and so a breeding in that and so here's uh, lungfish and you don't have to be a you know expert um, vet or in animal ecology to work out what's happened to those fish they've basically come over the spillway and had their head bashed in um, on the big concrete blocks at the bottom of the um, yeah so basically they've come over here gone down the spillway and then run into these concrete blocks at the bottom and had their heads bashed in so as part of the monitoring requirements for the dam there were requirements that for the first five years they monitor what happens um, to it and there was a series of reports a big one in february 2012 um, which was published by fisheries ecologists working for the yeah, Department of, it was um, Didi at the time, but basically fisheries officers within Queensland government. And this report was about the 
um, Paradise Dam Downstream Fishway Monitoring Program. It was the final report in that program, and it had been um, yeah done in a few years uh, in the in the last few years. It didn't include data from from um, the 2011 or later floods, but in the small floods, it indicated that. Queensland lungfish were being injured and killed during the passage over the dam wall in high and low flows. And here were some images that were included in that report. Here's a lungfish and it's, uh, the caption reads, a living but severely injured lungfish. So after the floods in 2010, the fisheries officers um, went in boats um, around the base of the dam and tried to collect um, fish that were injured or in distress. So this is one of the fish they found and you can again It's pretty obvious what has happened. There's this big scar across its um, Midsection and it's pretty obvious that it's gone over the fish wall and slammed sideways into one of the steps and Here's another injury to it. So it hasn't had its head bashed in but it's almost been killed it's severely imaged severely damaged and this was another part from the report. In the early stages of the sp spillway flow period, fish were observed and recorded on video passing over the spillway, striking the wall surface and being projected into the air before striking the wall again. The descent of fish such as long-finned eel could sometimes be followed and the fish retrieved. All long-finned eels retrieved in such a manner had obvious strike injuries and were deceased when collected. Larger fish species such as lungfish, golden perch and barramundi exhibited localised inju injuries consistent with striking hard objects. Injuries were extensive and obvious and consisted of abrasions, descaling and head damage. For instance, um, figure 28, which is this one, which is a deceased golden perch that was collected downstream of the Paradise Dam after a small flood in 2010. Note the strike mark extending from the dorsal to the ventral area, so this here. So it's run into a step on its way down. So that's from the government report. Um, they managed to, co to collect, and just think about this, you know, from a workplace health and safety perspective, they wouldn't have been able to go out in the, in the major part of the um, flood. Um, they've gone out to collect fish. It would have been after most of the water had passed over. Even so, they collected hundreds of um, dead fish. So including 152 Queensland lungfish. So huge mortalities. Um, here's um, another thing that happens is, apart from going over the spillways, if fish go through, when they release water through the normal um, release valves, basically a lot of fish get killed in that way. So this is a lungfish that was um, severely in injured after releases through the, the normal um, fish sort of water tower. And here's a, um, a long finned eel with a broken spine after going through the water release valves. So dams are hugely damaging to rivers. You know, this is in the normal, even leaving aside the spillway, this is injuries that occurred in the normal operation of the water releases from the dam. And this is the one that made me sick when I saw it. Um, you just this is pieces of a fish um, shown di directly at the release point from the environmental tower immediately after being shut down. So this fish has obviously gone through, gotten caught and just been shredded as it's gone through the water release mechanism. So it's just its skin is left. So yeah, the whole thing just yeah, obliterated and yeah, just disgusting. Now, all of that is background to look at, well, how was this assessed and how was it proved and how do we allow all of these impacts to occur? So this dam was assessed under all of the modern environmental laws that we've still got in place. So 20 years ago, we had in place the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act at a federal level. We had the Water Act uh, at a state level. There was also the State Development and Public Works Organization Act. Um, the, remember, we talked about that in relation to mining and environmental impact statement processes under that act. So the dam, because it was proposed by the government, it was very controversial. It was um, had a lot of potential impacts. It was declared a significant project under the 
State Development Public Works Organization Act, and that meant it underwent an environmental impact statement process. So in that process, there's public submissions, terms of reference are prepared. Then an EIS is prepared by the proponent, which was a state government um, owned corporation. Public submissions on that, there was a lot of opposition. I remember actually when I was at uni, so this is back in 2003, this was in 2000, I think this EIS was prepared around 2000, yeah, 2001 to 2003. So um, I was a, an undergrad student at the University of Queensland um, at that point, studying law and science and ecology. And I remember going up um, to one of the protests at the dam, at the site of the dam. There's a lot of protests against it saying, you know, this dam is unnecessary, uh, that it's going to cause huge environmental impacts. Um, those protests were basically ignored. And it went through the EIS process. The proponent prepared its report. The coordinator general um, approved it. Um, I think it's really interesting to look back at the analysis of the EIS after years uh, and basically look at, well, how well did the analysis stack up? And what you see is the EIS was complete bullshit. It didn't actually capture what the impacts would be. Um, it's just this puffery um, greenwash. So here's an extract from the map, sorry, from the EIS showing um, a graph showing what is the expected flow downstream from the dam um, before and after the dam. So pre the dam going in are the blue bars and post the dam is the modeled what will be the average releases. So you can see there that most um, water flows in January, February, March. So this is the wet season. And you can see there basically just the idea is that you take a bit of the water during the wet season and then during the dry season winter, a little bit is released. So you capture it during summer and you release it during winter. And the big message that you get from a graph like this is that basically there's very little change to water flow. The reality though was, is very different. The, the actual dam in operation hugely changed um, the flow of the river. So this graph looks complicated and I'll just unpack it a bit. So it shows data from October 2005 through to June 2009. Um, this shows daily releases from the dam and it's on the right hand side. Um, its bar is on the right hand side. So basically there were zero releases from the dam during that period. The black um, shows inflow. So there was a big inflow right at the start of when the dam was first constructed and started capturing water. So it filled up to about 60% virtually immediately after being constructed. But none of that was really released. Um, then there's a whole series of big sort of flood events in February, March 2008. Um, well, actually they're not that big, but they're flood events in February 2009. So they're the wet seasons. And notice that basically none of that is being released from the from the dam. So the models were showing that there wouldn't be much change. The actual change in the river flow is pretty radical. The other big thing that you get from this is that there were pretty well zero water sales during that period. And why that's significant is this period is a period of extensive drought. So um, from 2005 to about 2009, there was a massive drought in Queensland. And during this period, this dam is capturing a lot of water, but releasing virtually none. And the whole idea with the dam was that it would release water for downstream farmers to use. So you might think, well, why is it releasing no water? Um, and digging into those figures, um, I had a number of honours students look at them um, a few years ago and what the story that comes out is basically the dam was unnecessary there was already sufficient um, water infrastructure within the Burnett River to capture sufficient water for um, farmers and so this dam was just additional to the dams and weirs that were already there and during this big drought 
farmers um, weren't um, buying water from it and it basically the dam operator just kept the water um, and so allowed the dam to fill up and didn't release any. So uh, the big message that comes out of this data is that there were zero water sales during this drought period and it really looks like the dam is um, not serving any commercial purpose and not really benefiting um, the community in terms of improved water um, availability. And that, that sort of conclusion is difficult to come by um, if you try and get data out of the Queensland government or the operator of the dam Sunwater, because they, if you try and get that sort of information, they claim commercial incompetence and you won't get, you know, you'll never get figures from them talking about whether the dam is operating at a profit or not. But what this data indicates is that there's no water releases during this big drought. It's, it's the logical conclusion is that the dam is not actually, wasn't actually needed. During that period as well, um, so this is another graph um, which came from that court case I was involved in and it shows from the period 2005 to 2011 um, and basically we got data about the operation of the fishways and the red line shows downstream fishway operation. The downstream fishway didn't operate uh, at all from uh, 2005 to 2009, so four years with no connectivity at all downstream. Um, the upstream fishway is the blue line and it operated a, a bit um, in about 2008 um, for a period. This all coincided with um, the court case about lack of operation. So the, the operator became really interested in trying to get the fishways to work while there was litigation about it. But then in January 2011, the fishways were damaged um, and the control of the dam was damaged by the floods. And then um, it basically didn't operate for years after that as well. So in the 15 years of operation of this dam, the data that I've seen indicates that the fishways have operated for less than 5% of the time. So think about that. Less than 5% of the time they've installed these things. They were actually really expensive. Of the capital costs for the dam, the fishways cost about $20 million out of a total spend um, of $240 million. So it's about 10% of the cost of the dam went into these fishways and they basically haven't been operated. So what's the impact of the failure to operate the fishways for an extended period? And what I want to um, bring out um, at this point is the importance of monitoring. So in the approvals of this dam at a federal level and a state level, there were requirements in the conditions for monitoring. And that's where the Department of Fisheries was engaged to carry out the monitoring. There was a series of reports. I've just put a couple of covers um, showing you from 2008. And here's the sort of work. I just want to talk to you about, you know, what they were doing as part of the monitoring program. And, and you know, you guys, if you're an environmental manager, an environmental scientist, if you, you know, in the future, uh, you know, there's so much work for you in your careers in in carrying out what's required to be done by conditions of approval. So the conditions of approval for this dam required the dam operator to monitor what was happening to a range of fish. This is some of the ecologists, the fisheries biologists doing work to um, fulfill those conditions of approval. So here's a fisheries biologist inserting a tag into a fish. So they basically make a little cut in the fish and they then sew it, they, they put the little tag in and then sew it back up and release the fish. And the fish are then monitored um, with antennas on the um, dam wall monitoring um, their detection. And so these antennas were put up and the lungfish that were monitored in this way, basically this graph shows um, fish uh, against um, the blue line shows inflows into the dam reservoir. So you can see a flood there in February of 2007, um, another inflow in July of 2008. 
and then the X's mark the distance that this particular fish, so this was a fish that was tagged number 19.68. I think the tags relate to the radio frequency of um, the particular tag. So individuals, um, when it was tagged, it was a metre long, 7.6 kilogram male lungfish, and it was monitored for a year in 2007, 2008. And this shows its movements from um, released at the dam wall in um, August 2007, and it swam 20 kilometers upstream in December 2007, came back to the dam wall, swam upstream again, came back to the dam wall, hung around the dam wall, um, swam upstream again, came back to the dam wall, swam upstream again, ultimately a year later, 30 kilometers upstream of the dam wall. So this fish is moving around, but unable to get past the dam wall. So in terms of the movement of the fish, what you conclude from this sort of data is it's moving extensively. Um, during this period, there was no downstream fish way um, operating, so there was no way it could get past the dam wall. There was also no floods in this period, so it wasn't going to go over the, the spillway. There was no way it could get past the dam wall. Now, lungfish are supposed to be um, relatively sedimentary. They, if they find somewhere they like, they basically stay in that spot. This data is showing that this fish isn't happy. It's moving around in the dam reservoir looking for a good spot. Um, it swims upstream, it comes back to the dam wall, it swims upstream again. So this is that same uh, individual showing locations within the dam reservoir. So one and two, it starts here. And then um, three, then it moves a little bit upstream, five, um, six, it's swum upstream, seven, it's coming back downstream, uh, eight, it's back near the dam wall, nine, 10, 11, around the dam wall, and then 12, it's swum back upstream, and then 13, 30 kilometers upstream from the dam wall. So this is this fish monitored moving around in the dam reservoir. So the monitoring requirements imposed on the dam show that it's having significant major impacts on restricting movement of lungfish. It's also uh, having massive increased mortality. So as I said at the start, what this dam has done is caused um, a large amount of destruction of previously good fish habitat. Um, it's basically now um, pretty bad fish habitat. Dams are bad for most fish because they don't allow um, plants to grow, their water level constantly it regularly changes, they're um, generally poor fish habitat compared with the natural river. So major changes in the in the downstream fish or downstream flow regime, it's a major barrier to fish passage and also a lot of fish mortality on the steppe spillway. And the salt and the wound for this project is when you actually look at it, you know, you might think you know, in terms of sustainability, we talk about balancing environmental impacts with social and economic benefits. And if you, you, can, you can justify bad environmental impacts if you make enough money or society benefits from a project sufficiently. But when you look at the data on this dam, the things that jump out at you are there's a massive environmental impact. There's also looks to be not only little economic benefit, but a huge economic cost. The balance sheet for this dam looks to be in the red by something like seven hundred million dollars. And you make that can make that component. You can make that figure. Sorry, you come to that figure um, in this way. The original construction cost in two thousand and five was about two hundred and fifty million dollars. In that included $20 million for the fishways that hardly operate. Um, if you just put that at an annual loss of interest at like 8%, that would be $20 million. Or if you said, you know, 4%, that would be still $10 million um, that you'd be, no, $4 million or so that you'd be losing just in interest alone each, each year. So there's an initial $250 million cost plus ongoing capital costs. The normal operating costs are well in excess of $100,000. 
um, and the water sales are basically nil. And in the last few years, there's also been um, expensive repair bills carried out to the dam. And I'm going to uh, tell you <laughs> in a moment about the current proposals that it's about to be lowered because there's been faults in construction. But basically, this is an economic lemon. So what's happened um, in recent years is after the 2011 floods, there was something like a 50 or $80 million repair bill. Um, and that also led on to concerns about the structural integrity of the dam. And the Queensland government announced late last year that it would, because of problems with or faults in the construction of the dam, it was going to take five metres off the top of the spillway and reduce its capacity by 42%. So here's a, a, a screen grab from an ABC story from the 29th of November last year. Um, here's, just to step you through, so in 2011 there, the floods damaged the base of the dam. Here's the work being done to the base of the dam. I'm gonna show you a couple of pic pictures here and here, repairs being carried out. So here's those repairs. So this is in 2012. Um, yeah, basically strengthening the base of the dam. So again, 2012 repair works being carried out, tens of millions of dollars. Then in um, last year, the government released a report saying that the dam had to be lowered, that there was, after the 2013 floods, it was recognised that the dam was structurally unsound and that there was a risk that the whole dam could collapse in a major flood event and basically wipe out Bundaberg. So for safety reasons, the Queensland government has announced it's going to lower the dam. Um, here's an image, a recent image. Um, the government... Uh, has said that the issue related to the bonding between the layers of the roller compacted concrete. So the way the dam was constructed, again, to save money at the time, and so it could be laid really quickly, they used a technique called roller compacted concrete. And the bonding wasn't properly done, and it wasn't properly tested at the time. And so the whole thing is now found to be structurally unsound, and it's basically those layers are delaminating and the whole thing is at risk of collapsing. So this is a dam that is, own, this is one of, well, this is Queensland's newest dam. This, is, this isn't something that was built in the 1920s that, you know, is a century old. This is modern technology assessed through all of our modern um, regulatory processes. At the moment, there's been a commission of inquiry into the structural instability issues that was that report is actually due, supposed to be due in a few days time, the 30th of April, 2020. You can have a look at their website. There's not a lot there at the moment. There's been submissions and hearings. I wouldn't be surprised if the report is delayed a bit because of the coronavirus um, issues, um, but at least on paper, it's supposed to be due in three days time, its report. Now, the proposal to lower the dam has been met with local opposition. So this is a, um, a news story from um, 3rd of March, um, 2020. Bundaberg farmers call for Paradise Dam to be fixed, not lowered amid water security fears. Um, the, the lowering of the dam is, is supposed to um, commence um, next month as well. So in May 2020, again, that could be delayed because of coronavirus. Um, but yeah, on paper, it's meant to start next month. Um, the broader concerns on the community about um, lowering the dam and reducing water security, it's, to me, it's really unclear whether the dam actually supplies anyone beyond what could be provided by um, existing water infrastructure in the catchment. So to me, it's even unclear that if you took out the dam entirely, whether there would be any impact on the, on any real impact on farmers using water from, you know, within that catchment. So in short, this dam has been an unmitigated environmental and financial debacle and disaster. I think that's the only way it could be described. What laws regulate it? Um, I started the lecture by talking about um, the basic uh, approval processes that you need for um, 
associated with the Planning Act. So that's those sorts of approvals for you, are for your you know sort of day to day operations like small scale um, developments. For a big dam like this, um, it has to fit within multiple layers of planning, so and also requires approval at a federal level. So, in if we think about all the pieces of our regulatory system, uh, we've used this diagram before, the major pieces of the Queensland Environmental Legal S System from Lecture 1 in my synopsis book. So at a federal level, the uh, lungfish is listed as an endangered species. So there's a trigger um, under the EPBC Act for any action that will cause a significant impact to a matter of national environmental significance, including listed threatened species like the lungfish. So there's a trigger at a federal level. At a state level, um, there's planning done under the Water Act. There's also the EIS done under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. Approvals under the Fisheries Act for waterway barriers. Um, the Nature Conservation Act was involved as well because there was a small part of a national park that was within the water, the, the area that was to be flooded by this dam. So that had to be excised out of the national park. So multiple pieces of um, legislation involved. At a state government level, the EIS for the um, was done under the State Development Public Works Organisation Act. As I said, it gave it um, a recommended approval. It said that it would be a It was needed for financial reasons, and it would have a big benefit for businesses in um, the Burnett area. It doesn't seem that that's been correct. It also said that the environmental impacts could be managed through things like the fishways. Um, again, the environmental um, assessment in the EIS has been shown to be um, critically flawed. So in Queensland, there's a hierarchy for um, planning um, under our water laws. And I just summarise it very broadly. You don't need to really know it in detail. The main thing that you'll deal with on a day to day level involves, um, you know, small operational works. Uh, applications under the planning framework but at a broader level in Queensland the, that licensing system um, and entitlement system under the Water Act those things occur um, within a planning hierarchy uh, the Water Act sets it up the framework um, under that there's a series of water plans for different um, basins and then within that there's um, water um, licenses under that so this is an extract from the water plan Burnett Basin. I just want to show you this, just to um, mention the multiple layers of planning involved. So here we've got the plan area covering that catchment. The subcatchment areas are identified. And then there's a, um, an area called the Coastal Burnett Overland Flow Area, where building things like farm dams to capture um, water flowing across your property in a dam, those things can be regulated. Um, there's also groundwater management areas within the catchment, so up around Monto, as well as around the Bundaberg area. So not everywhere, um, groundwater isn't regulated everywhere, but within particular management areas it is. Um, there's also sub areas within, particularly around the coastal area, where farmers like sugarcane farmers want to extract groundwater. So around Bundaberg, um, groundwater is particularly managed. Um, and yeah... Um, there's also a monitoring framework within it, so surface node water extraction, sorry, water node location. So these, when they model water within a catchment, um, it's done around, they use um, computer models built around nodes. So, um, and it's a complicated system. We don't need to know the details of it for the purposes of our course. I just wanted to flag with you that there's all these layers of planning that are there. Um, done under the Water Act, then you've got the water plan and it goes down to a licensing regime. Um, what I've seen though with this dam is that the, those layers of planning, they, they look good on paper, but when you actually apply them in practice, um, yeah, it's you've got serious question marks about the sustainability of their actual implementation. So as I mentioned, I was involved in a big court case uh, about whether condition three of the federal approval was being complied with. It required that the 
uh, company building the dam must install a fish transfer device on the dam that was suitable for the lungfish and it had to commence when the dam became operational and so the litigation was about that. Um, the court found that um, we hadn't made out our case, that even though the fishway hadn't operated for years, there were big gaps when it wouldn't operate in the future, that it still um, complied with the condition of approval. So huge amount of um, work went into that case and we lost. And yeah, I lay awake for months after that, just thinking what a disaster, like what a disaster this development was and how we had, uh, yeah, it was really so many sleepless nights after that decision. It was just gut-wrenching that this terrible development that was causing this huge damage, um, yeah. I just wanted to mention before um, taking a break, um, one of the issues that I wanted to raise with you is that during that litigation, the conservation group challenging the operation of the dam couldn't get any dam engineers to work for the group as expert witnesses in the case. And I just wanted to open the floor. Why do you think that was the case? So they had money and they tried... To not drop clients up. Yep. Tarkin, that's exactly it. That um, basically the group went to different consultancies with money, tried to engage dam engineers to work for the group. No one would take it on. Um, and the simple reason was that the Queensland government was the defendant and that they didn't want to bite the hand that feeds them because most of their work would come from the Queensland government. So no one would act for the conservation group. And, and I've faced that problem a number of times when uh, acting against large companies or state government that expert witnesses simply won't act for you um, because they don't want to take on uh, groups that um, you know pay their bills, that will give them m work in the future. And I think that's a huge challenge for you guys in your careers because, you know, people studying environmental science, environmental management or planning, you know, we learn a lot of things at university about ethics and, you know, sustainability. And then you get that out there, you get out into the real world and a lot of it becomes about money and staying in business. And often it's hard not to frame your reports around what your client wants and um, basically just to become a hired gun it's hard it's a real challenge for your careers is how will you maintain you know the things that you started your career wanting to do like protect the environment or help the community um, how do you maintain that through your careers i found it a huge challenge in my career so in summary just i want to take a break um, but just to summarize this first part of the lecture, the wider context of this lecture, there's long-term and highly complex uh, environmental problems like managing um, river systems. The laws that regulate them are also highly complex um, and there's multiple layers to them. It's difficult. Um, monitoring uh, approval so the monitoring requirements of approvals are often important to see what impacts a project actually has. So EISs often paint a rosy picture of what will happen in the future, that if you allow this development to proceed, that there'll be a whole range of measures that will be put in place that will manage the development appropriately. And to me, what Paradise Dam graphically illustrates is how often EISs um, don't actually get it right, that this the EIS for this project just didn't predict the what actually would happen at all. And also they assume that things that are proposed will actually be able to work. And what I think was what happened in this case was the operator or the proponent of the dam proposed these fishways um, really as greenwash through the EIS process to allay... Um, community concerns about the impacts of the dam on fisheries and it gave it an answer during the approval process to address those concerns that say well we're going to build these fishways they'll be state-of-the-art there won't be big impacts on fisheries because of them 
when they actually get to operate them though, the thing that they had designed was so complicated, it constantly broke down and needed constant attention and money to keep it operating. So they just basically didn't operate it. Um, the monitoring showed that, um, but ultimately it hadn't, hasn't led to better outcomes because the monitoring didn't lead to any improvements really in the in the operation of the fishways. So it ultimately led to no benefit. Um, but it, I suppose you can say at least we know um, something of the picture of what damage is being done. I also wanted to emphasize the importance of courage and doing what you know is right, regardless of who's paying you. I think that's a huge challenge for your careers. It's um, hard when you're in the workplace to work on things that you know won't necessarily pay you a lot of money. Um, the the if you're working in pri private consultancies, there's so much pressure to do what your client wants. Um, just before, um, well, actually, we've been going for uh, an hour over an hour now. So um, why don't we take a ten minute break, come back, and I'll wrap up water. I just want to talk a little bit about the Murray Darling Basin. Uh, and then go on to fisheries and cultural heritage. So 10 minute break. We looked at the really the state regulatory regime um, in the first part of the lecture and the system of planning under the Water Act. And we saw that there was this debacle with the Paradise Dam, that it's been a financial and environmental disaster. That was all done under the modern Australian and Queensland regulatory system. At a day-to-day -day level, the thing that though that you're more involved in um, will be with the planning system. You can require development approvals uh, if there's things that interfere with waterways or you're extracting water. So there can be approval requirements under the Planning Act as well as uh, water licenses under the Water Act required for your entitlement, water entitlement. So that's at a state level. But before leaving water, I just wanted to um, mention the controversy around the Murray-Darling Basin plan. So, uh, so during this massive drought in 2003 to about 2008 that occurred in Australia and Queensland, the, there was a huge amount of pressure on the federal government to take action. And John Howard, who was the Prime Minister of the time, ultimately... Um, led uh, the enactment of the Water Act 2007, which, was, which is Commonwealth level legislation under which the major idea was that there would be a Murray-Darling Basin plan to better manage uh, the Murray-Darling because back at, in that, during that drought, the Murray was in dire straits, um, lots of fish kills, lots of problems with low flows. And those had resulted from a century of over allocation. So during the period where basically there was very little regulation of vegetation clearing and water extraction, basically people, farmers uh, and industries extracted huge amounts of water from rivers in an unregulated system. Then uh, in recent decades, as that system came to be regulated and we started to plan um, and um, model, you know, what could the river actually um, allow extraction of. What we found is that for big systems like the Murray-Darling, we'd, uh, we'd over allocated um, what could actually be extracted from the river and still maintain a healthy ecosystem. So um, these entitlements and trying to um, buy them back or reduce the amount that people used has been a huge problem. Uh, and in the Murray-Darling, um, there's ongoing problems with that. So um, for folk who are from overseas, um, you um, may have heard of the Murray-Darling. So Australia's biggest river system, it stretches from Queensland um, all the way down to um, South Australia. So here's the headwaters up in Queensland. Um, it's also uh, headwaters in New South Wales and Victoria, all flowing down to um, the Meningi Lakes um, for in South Australia basically is where the river flows out into the ocean. So there's this huge catchment 
It's Australia's um, primary area for a huge amount of agriculture, wineries, um, wheat, cotton. It's uh, Australia's bread bowl, really. So massive amount of agricultural production in the Murray-Darling Basin. So if you look at, this is just an image showing the east coast of Australia. I like it because it shows the mountain range. So the Great Dividing Range runs along the east coast of Australia and much of it drains um, into the Murray-Darling Basin. So once you get over the Great Dividing Range uh, on the western side of it, most of it drains down into the Murray-Darling Basin. So here's the area covered by the basin plan. Again, we've got Queensland up here, we're, we're here in Brisbane. And so going down to New South Wales, Victoria and Adelaide. So all of this was meant to be covered by the basin plan because, because there are four states involved in the management of it, um, particularly um, New South Wales and Victoria, um, were happy to extract water. Um, South Australia was the one that ultimately um, bore the brunt of over extraction because water didn't get down to its, um, its farmlands. So uh, South Australia has always been highly critical of over extraction in the upper catchment. New South Wales and Victoria, as well as Queensland, have allowed a lot of extraction of water. So the draft basin plan in 2010 uh, was complicated. It looked at modeling of the um, whole system and looked at the long-term average rainfall um, and that the long-term average rainfall in the basin is about um, 500,000 gigalitres. And then the amount of rainfall that ends up in the river system or inflow is about 32,000 gigalitres uh, from surface flow and 26,000 gigalitres from groundwater flow. So what happens to, the, so 500,000 gigalitres of, of water falls in the catchment and only about 50,000 or 10% ends up flowing into the river. What happens to the other 90%? Uh, evaporation. Yeah, great point. Um, I think that's Tarkin. It's evaporation. So when we think about a water budget for a catchment, it's not simply how much rain falls, but how much then um, actually gets into the creeks and rivers. And in Australia, on average, about 90% of rainfall evaporates. So uh, that's consistent with these figures. Uh, of that 500,000 gigalitres, most of it evaporates. And so you only end up with about 50,000 gigalitres um, discharging into the creeks. And that's immediately, um, I just mentioned that that's one of the big concerns with climate change, because with increasing um, surface temperatures, once you increase temperature, you also increase evaporation. And because most of our river systems, evaporation is you know, such a massive component of the water budget, if you increase evaporation only a small amount, it has a disproportionate impact on the water you end up with in your creeks uh, and in your river systems, in your, in your dams, because evaporation is, is such a massive component of the overall system. So if you increase evaporation by 1%, it's like you decrease um, the amount that ends up in your rivers by about 10%. So huge implications for the Murray-Darling of climate change and increasing temperature. So in the plan in 2010, basically you don't need to know the details, but um, the red areas are the um, subcatchments within the Murray-Darling that they saw as in poor condition, that essentially there was massive over extraction of them. So including areas in Queensland that's shown in red, but significant areas in New South Wales as well, and then also down into um, South Australia. So what they proposed to do was return an additional 3,000 gigalitres to the environment. And modelling that, they um, saw that, that that would substantially improve the health of the overall river system. Now, what that led to was this huge um, public um, protest. So the Murray-Darling Basin um, Commission wrote a draft plan in 2010. It was released 
And this is an image of farmers protesting against the plan, basically. Yeah. Um, and then there were these um, infamous pictures taken of, so the Murray-Darling Basin Commission planned to go and do public um, presentations about what it was proposing. And this is images of um, farmers and um, workers burning copies of the plan. So, um, you know, it looks like something out of um, Nazi Germany, burning books or the like, but it was, it, it reflected the, the raw anger of the community against a proposal to return or to reduce the amount of water that was available for agricultural use within the catchment. And so what happened after that was that um, they took all of the members of the Murray-Darling Basin Commission, um, they um, took them all out the back and they shot them all. No, I'm um, only joking. Um, um, black humour. They didn't shoot the Murray-Darling Commission um, members, but they uh, basically they all resigned. And then a new commission um, was... Um, appointed and the new commission basically proposed a new draft that returned less water to the environment and ultimately it was um, um, passed uh, and became the Murray-Darling Basin Plan in 2011 and it was claimed that it you know the, the less water going back to the environment was still meeting the the objectives of the plan um, this is a comment from 2012 that I think was really apt. The tricky politics and the cross-state conflicts have seen an aggressive 20-week consultation period where just about everyone with an interest has lined up to kick the Murray-Darling Basin Authority. So um, there were some criticisms of the revised plan in 2012. I won't go into the details of them, but basically there was a lot of criticisms uh, of the um, lack of water going back for the environment, also that it didn't take into account um, climate change impacts. It also didn't take into account extraction from coal seam gas to groundwater and the impacts that that would have on the plan. So fast forward to the last um, year or two, and this plan has basically been shown to be you know, an emperor with no clothes on. In the last 18 months, there have been huge fish kills in the Murray-Darling, um, huge impacts um, basically through lack of water. And there's this great, um, a great article that I wanted to point out to you that was on the um, conversation website just a few days ago. And I just thought it was an excellent, excellent summary of, uh, like I've been following these issues for a decade, and this is a really good um, sort of summary of where we are at the moment, because this is an ongoing festering sore in Australia's environmental um, regime. Um, and yeah, basically, when was it written? It was, I don't see a date on that, um, but it was only a few, oh, the 17th of April this year. Uh, and it was talking about a report that had been released um, at our national, our national government is made up at the moment of a coalition. Um, in, in the coalition is a party called the National Party, which is um, its policy platform is meant to um, protect farmers. So it's been very vocal in criticising the Murray-Darling plan, calling for more water for farmers. They're in charge or, you know, they're an important component in the federal government at the moment. And so the Murray-Darling Basin Plan is very controversial uh, and ongoing problems. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll put that link. Um, it's on my Twitter feed, but have a read of it. I think it's just such a, a really interesting analysis of where we are at the moment with um, climate change and the Murray-Darling Basin Plan with big fish kills in it. So at a federal level, we've got the Water Act. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan was a revised version of what was created in 2012. We're still seeing um, ongoing um, problems with it. It's a very, very political, very difficult um, uh, issue to, to, to deal with. So um, just going back to the slides, um, 
that's really all I wanted to say about the Murray-Darling Basin. Uh, I want to move on to fisheries. It's a very important topic for Australia. I, there's no simple solutions to it, um, but it's a massive political fight that's been going on for two decades at least in Australia. Um, and it just really is really hard. Um, there's no simple solutions for it. Okay, so that's the Murray-Darling Basin. So I want to move on to marine conservation and fisheries laws just briefly. I um, won't spend a lot of time on this because this isn't a topic that uh, I think for most people you won't deal with fisheries and marine conservation much in your day-to-day -day work. And I want to really, I've always tried to focus this course on the things that are uh, most important for your first few years in professional practice. Uh, if you're working in you know, in the marine conservation sector, you'll get to know these laws intimately. I just want to summarize them um, to um, just fill in the picture for you of an, an, another important part of our regulatory system. But as I say, one that you don't generally come across in day to day unless, you know, you're in that part of the sector that works on them or you're a, you know, you, you work in fisheries or you're a fisherman um, uh, and, you know, you're subject to the laws yourself. So what laws regulate fishing in Queensland? I've put a summary in my little synopsis book. There's actually a whole range of laws um, depending on jurisdictions for the federal and state um, government. Um, I'll just summarise them, uh, really illustrate them with a couple of examples or problems um, involving sort of fish habitat and fish passage and the law and the like. So remember back a few lectures ago, we looked at um, development offences and we looked at a, a company that was prosecuted for clearing mangroves so uh, that was a prosecution under the Planning Act and the Fisheries Act and that's an example of part of the laws protecting fish habitat so marine plants are protected under the Planning Act and the Fisheries Act and clearing mangroves requires a development approval um, subject to exemptions, uh, you know, there's small scale exemptions around existing pontoons and those sorts of things. But generally, a development like this where you want to clear a, a large number of mangroves requires a development approval. So there's a Fisheries Act prohibits clearing of marine plants, including mangroves, uh, and the Planning Act. Um, if you clear mangroves like that, you're carrying out accessible development, and um, that's an offence against the Planning Act. So just as an example of the sorts of things that you see up in terms of um, approvals, this is just an example um, from University of Queensland. Well, actually, this isn't University of Queensland. This is just near where I live. This was a little notice up with um, Brisbane City Council that they'd um, uh, put up a temporary waterway barrier and they were undertaking maintenance in essentially a creek that had been turned into a drain. And this was a little barrier that they had up um, that that notice was associated with. So this is just an example of compliance with the requirements of the planning system. Here's another example. Um, this is the UQ ferry terminal. So if you've caught the ferry from University of Queensland, here's a couple of images of when it was being constructed. And when they constructed the ferry terminal, they had to um, remove some mangroves uh, along the creek. And this is just an image I took showing um, like the sediment fencing uh, that they'd installed uh, and the signage um, saying operational works. This is for the removal, damage or destruction of marine plants and they give an approval reference number. So that's just a signpost to show people that what they're doing complies with the law. So that's an example of how marine plants are brought into the planning framework and again we don't need to spend a lot of time on that because we've dealt with the planning framework already earlier in the course so marine plants are protected under the planning framework let's just move briefly to commercial and recreational fishing and just to give you a couple of examples illegal fishing and also um, the great barrier reef so this is a picture of a fellow um, being arrested back in 2009 um, these pictures were given to me by the F Queensland um, Fisheries and Boating Patrol. Um, so this fellow was arrested um, just north of um, Brisbane uh, in Redcliffe. 
Uh, he was arrested twice. No, actually, wrong word. Um, he was stopped twice, and there were charges um, related to two offences. First, he was located um, at Nudgee Creek near Sandgate in November 2009, and then he was found a month later uh, in Redcliffe. So he wasn't actually arrested, but he was charged with essentially illegal f commercial fishing. So at the one at Nudgee, he was located um, by um, fisheries officers and they followed him and then they intercepted him. And um, he was in um, the Redcliffe incident, he was, he was um, intercepted here. So amidst the mangroves, and basically what he was doing was um, he was um, taking a lot of fish for sale and he didn't have a license as a um, commercial fisherman. Uh, he also were taking, was taking a lot of um, fish that were undersized, the wrong sexes and the like. So here's some pictures of um, taken on his boat. Here's an extract from the prosecution. So they... Um, the complaint was about him having um, mud crabs that were too small, um, female mud crabs, a um, whole range of offences related to it. And he was prosecuted and fined $30,000 for uh, having 52 undersized mud crabs, 49 female mud crabs, 95 mud crabs in excess of the bag limits for recreational fishermen, unmarked crab pots and a commercial fishing net. So basically, uh, our fisheries laws allow a lot of recreational fishing to occur um, without a license. But once you uh, want to sell what you catch, you require a license to be a commercial fisherman. Um, for both commercial fishermen and um, recreational fishermen, there are things like bag limits. There's a whole range of laws related to the sexes you can catch, closed seasons, the sizes of things that you can catch. It's a complicated framework around, built around protecting fisheries. And that's created at a state level under the Fisheries Act. So that's an important framework for fisheries um, protection. Um, if we go up to the Great Barrier Reef, I just wanted to mention how it works. So if we zoom in on the Whitsundays, and going to um, use an idea of um, spearfishing just north, um, the Whitsundays is where I'm from. So let's just say we wanted to go up and spearfish um, at Grassy Island, which is just north of Ellie Beach in the Whitsundays, and we want to spearfish here on this reef. So here's a picture of me a long time ago with my brother and uh, uncle. Right at that location, we um, we're spearfishing, we caught a couple of mackerel and a coral trout there, my uncle Johnny. So if you wanted to go there and, and fish now, could you spearfish for that? So you dive down with a spear gun and you shoot the fish, you can see there um, the hole where the spear has gone through. So if you want to do something within the Great Barrier Reef, you've got to comply with the law. And the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park has been declared along, along most of the um, Queensland coast. It, within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, there's what's called a uh, multi-use planning and there's a zoning plan that allows different activities to occur in different areas. So this is an extract of the zoning plan for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park around the Whitsundays. So here's Early Beach and Grassy Island is up here. So... Grassy Island, you can see it's in, um, see the different colors. They relate to the different zones. So there's green is a no fishing area. Yellow um, is another zone. Um, the light blue uh, and darker blue. So Grassy Island is in the darkest blue. So here's just a summary of what's allowed in those different areas. So um, this is an activities guide. You commonly see if you're looking to go fishing in the Great Barrier Reef or other marine parks, they have these simple guides that are printed with maps that tell you basically what you can do in different areas. So um, you look down this list and um, spearfishing limited spearfishing by snorkel only is this entry here. So in um, spearfishing is allowed in the general use zone. 
So that's the light blue. And it's also allowed in the habitat protection zone. See the ticks? In the green zones, um, it's not allowed. And in the pink zones, which is scientific research, it's not allowed. Um, also in the buffer zones and conservation parks, it is allowed to a limited extent. So that's yellow. So if we just go back, so you're not allowed to spearfish um, in those green areas, but you can in those darkest blue areas. So if you wanted to go and spearfish um, today at that same location, you would be allowed to do it as a recreational um, fisherman. Um, you can only spearfish, one of the other things it said there is um, by snorkel only. So the fisheries laws prohibit spearfishing with scuba tanks. You've got to basically use a snorkel, so you have to hold your breath. Um, so uh, as a recreational fisherman, you can go and snorkel. So in answer to the question, could we go and spearfish there today? Yes, we could. Um, if we were using snorkels only and we're, we're recreational um, spearfishers, we can go and do it. That's still subject to um, restrictions about the number of fish we can take, um, their sizes, um, the closed seasons and other things. But the basic point that I want to just communicate to you is that there's a zoning plan. It looks a lot like um, the same sort of zoning plan that you've seen under the planning framework. And it's for marine um, protected areas and different uses. So multi-use marine park planning uh, is, has been championed with the Great Barrier Reef. It's been a lot of this sort of planning has been copied in many places around the world um, based on the Great Barrier Reef being a leading example of multi-use planning. So um, the, the system of multi-use planning has also been copied. So the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park is at a federal level. Um, most of the marine planning in the GBR is done under the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act. The state also has a similar um, marine park zoning system that uses the same sort of colours. Um, Moreton Bay next to Brisbane is a marine park under the um, Queensland Marine Parks Act. The colours you'll see look very similar, greens and yellows. And um, so it's consistent with the um, federal level uh, planning approach. So there's complex jurisdictional issues within the marine environment. I don't need to dwell on that. If you work, if you end up working in the coastal um, margin, you'll you know you'll deal with complex um, jurisdictional um, issues. Um, additionally, I would just mention Australia's maritime zones. Uh, so Australia can regulate um, fishing and uh, use of marine resources within its national waters. So that's the exclusive economic zone, which is shown in this map. So that's under the international law or under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, if you're interested in, in that international layer, you can have a look at um, my lectures on international law and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change as part of the um, summer semester course uh, that I've run in the last few years, International Regulatory Frameworks for Climate Change and Environmental Management. Okay, so that's fisheries. I only wanted to touch upon it just to, you know, it's, a, it's an important component of our regulatory system. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because at a day-to-day -day level, you relatively rarely come across it in, in practice unless you're working in that area. Okay, let's move on to the final topic for today, which is cultural heritage. So um, remember, Back when we were looking at the development assessment system, we looked at this property in Warwick, the um, Plums Chambers. And remember, we um, looked at, you know, what approvals do you need for demolishing Plums Chambers? And we found that the property was on the Queensland Heritage List and that that meant that there was a state level trigger uh, for assessment of it and yeah, that development of a place listed on the Queensland Heritage Register is accessible development under the Planning Act. So that's an important component of protecting built cultural heritage in Queensland's framework. And again, I don't need to spend a lot of time on it because we've dealt with the planning framework. This is 
you know, this is one component where we just get to link back to the earlier lectures. So when we think about cultural heritage, built cultural heritage is generally protected under registers like the Queensland Heritage List. And then there's restrictions on destroying, actively destroying things that are on the Queensland Heritage List. list. So, yeah, the Queensland Heritage Act um, deals with accessible development. We talked about that um, in that lecture, so I won't dwell on it now. So that's an important component of cultural heritage protection. But what I want to just spend a few minutes on to wrap up the lecture is Indigenous cultural heritage and native title. So this uh, can be much more difficult to um, regulate. There's a, a number of reasons why it's more difficult to regulate and protect. Um, one being that for many sites, like built cultural heritage, so European cultural heritage like a building, you, it's relatively easy to identify. For many um, sites that are culturally significant to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, it might not be obvious to the eye, um, unless you're aware of the, the cultural significance of them, it might not be obvious why they are significant. And so um, something like this, where there's cave paintings, um, that's obvious. But if a site has um, spiritual or cultural significance, um, but a non Aboriginal person just sees it as part of a normal landscape. Identifying that, also including it on lists, can be difficult because they can be there can be knowledge that is meant to be um, secret to a particular tribe or a particular group or a particular sex. So, uh, you know, our uh, Aboriginal and, and Torres Strait Islander culture uh, is just amazing, stretching back um, fifty thousand years or more, uh, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have a huge, huge, rich history. Um, over 2,500 generations ago, uh, humans reached um, Australia. It's thought that they spread across Southeast Asia in a number of different waves. Um, this is an article from 2011 about um, uh, yeah, Australian Aboriginal migration a rich area of um, research and ongoing research about that spread and when they arrived in Australia. So this is a, a map that's commonly shown when we talk about um, pre-invasion um, in pre-1770, um, pre-Europeans uh, invading Australia. There was a rich um, culture of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders um, these multiple colours uh, show the, what was thought to be the general location of the larger groups of Aboriginal people. There were many, many languages spoken within this and rich cultures um, within it. And then um, Australia was invaded by um, Europeans and essentially conquered. Uh, and the traditional owners um, in many parts um, driven off their land um, and so a lot of that culture has been um, severely damaged. Now, though, there, is, there are significant laws to um, try and protect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, culture. So at a federal level, there's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Heritage Protection Act. Uh, at a state level, there's the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Act 2003 and the Torres Strait Islander Cultural Heritage Act. There's also the Native Title Act 1993. So I talk a little bit about native title. So prior to a big high court decision, so high, the high court is our top court in Australia, and there's a famous decision um, called Mabo, and it involved a challenge by um, Eddie Mabo and a number of others from the Torres Strait, so in the northern part of Queensland. Uh, up until... Um, the Mabo decision in 1992, the law in Australia didn't recognise uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders having any title over land. And that was fundamentally based on a very racist um, view. Um, under international law, it, was, it had been assumed up until that point that Australia um, was terra nullius, which is a Latin term 
meaning law belonging to no one. And under international law, if a country found land that was terra nullius, it could simply take it. And the law then applied that the invader, the people that had found it uh, applied. So up until 1992, the law had assumed that uh, Europeans had found land belonging to no one. And the fundamental reason why that view was taken was that it, it, the Aboriginal people weren't seen as human. So that was obviously an abhorrent um, racist um, view. And the High Court in 1992 overturned that and said, well, it's factually wrong. When Europeans arrived in um, 1970, and sorry, in the 1770, um, with the English um, um, convicts arriving and gradually then taking over Australia, um, the land wasn't terra nullius. There was a culture here. There were people here. They had property rights. And the High Court in Mabo recognised the concept of native title. And that was a revolution in many ways because it, it upended the whole land tenure system in Australia. And suddenly there was a recognition that Aboriginal people had um, native title. And what did that mean for other property rights that had been granted in the couple of centuries since? And it's a sad area of our law. It, it, yes, it's positive that um, native title was recognised. Um, and native title um, is a term that conveniently describes the interests and rights of indigenous inhabited, inhabitants in land to um, do things to um, fulfill their traditional customs um, and laws. So native title is variable and there's been a system set up to recognize it, the remnants of it. So as a practical example, here's something that was recognized in 2001 for in the Croker Island case. It was native title was defined in that case for that group as being the rights to fish, hunt and gather within the claimed area for the purpose of satisfying their personal, domestic and non-commercial needs, um, including observing traditional, cultural, ritual and spiritual laws and customs and having access to the sea and seabed within the claimed area to exercise those rights. So access. Um, native title has been found to have been extinguished on all freehold land. So on about 20% of Queensland, native title has been extinguished. Um, on the remaining areas like leasehold land, generally native title continues to exist when it's recognised, but it has to be exercised um, so as not to infringe um, other um, rights of other landholders. So if a um, cattle farm exists on land that's recognised to have native title, the um, native title holders can't go on and just throw out the um, cattle um, property um, and you know cast the farmer off the land. The farm will continue to exist, but they're meant to coexist. So the farm is meant to allow Aboriginal people to go onto the land to hunt and to exercise their native title rights. So um, basically, it's still a very... Uh, my view a very still a very shameful area because a lot of native title has been extinguished because the traditional owners were killed or forcibly removed from their country and to me one of the worst aspects of our native title system is that um, native title holders who were driven off their land and put on in the particularly in the last century people were taken off their land and put into missions and, and other areas so that um, you know, farmers could farm their land. So if people were moved off their land and then lost the connection with their country, then their native title is taken to have been extinguished. And that's such a grossly unfair um, system. It's just a really sad system, but there's, there's a huge amount of work in it. And na native title is important. I, I I find it hard to find the right words to express the... Yes, it's a lot better than what existed before Marbo. It's a very complex system. It's imperfect. Um, it's still, I think, still a very shameful system. 
I'm just going to show you some um, some very sad images. Uh, I give a warning that I'm going to show some people that have died and in many indigenous Australian cultures to hear or see someone who has passed away causes great distress and grief. Um, also within the mourning process, while it's been carried out, what's called the sorry business, all of that person's personal belongings and photographs are generally destroyed by uh, Aboriginal Australians and that ensures that their spirit can go safely onto the next world. And it's also very common for that person's name never to be spoken um, for the very same reason. I'm going to show you the pictures though because um, while re wanting to respect Aboriginal culture, I think it's also important that we recognise the injustice of past treatment of Aboriginal people. So here's essentially slavery in 1896, Aboriginal prisoners in chains, um, so Aboriginal slavery, um, another picture of Aboriginal slavery in police custody in 1906, um, mass massacres and genocide occurring. Um, this is an 1888 drawing of a massacre at Queensland's, by Queensland's native police at Skull Hole and Mistake Creek near Winton. Um, and the Guardian ran a really important project a few years ago looking at locations of massacres across Australia between 1794 and 1928. And yeah, there were very significant um, massacres, including in Queensland, with hundreds of Aboriginals being killed. So this is an extract from a letter uh, from 1846. The Aboriginal people are very quiet here now, poor wretches. No wild beast of the forest was ever hunted down with such unsparing pervasiveness as they are. Men, women and children are shot whenever they can be met with. Um, I have protested against it at every station I've been in in southeast Victoria in the strongest language. But these things are kept very secret and the penalty would, cer would certainly be hanging. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very bad part of Australia's history. So in that context, um, the Native Title Act, it's better than the system that was before. It deals with um, a people that have been very badly abused. It, it provides some recognition of their, the title that's left. Um, there's important legislation about it, the Native Title Act. You can find more details about it on the um, National Native Title Tribunal website. Um, Dealing with the Native Title Act 1993, the Future Acts Regime, Iliwas, the Indigenous Land Use Agreements. Um, a lot of information about that. I won't go into any more detail though. I just wanted to give you an example um, of a native title claim by the Wangan and Jangalingu peoples. Um, this is a claim that overlaps with the Adani mine in central Queensland. And there's a great film clip that I just want to sh play for you that runs briefly. So here's a map of their claimed area, um, just inland from Mackay, so the Wangan and Jagalingu peoples. And I just want to play you a little bit of a clip. It goes for two minutes. This is the origin of my ancestry, my great-great-grandmother's country. This is how it was since the beginning of time. Our connection to the land is a spiritual connection. And we revive that spirit and we develop that spirit through our song and dance and stories. We're the Wangan Jagalingu people here. We stand on the land of our ancestors. Our law goes back to time immemorial. It comes from the water. We call the water the Kamu Kamu. And this big gully here is the Balbra where the water is. And in the beginning, in the creation period, when the Great Spirit made the sun, the Kari, and as the water fell from the heavens, the sun shined through the water. And there appeared the Mandanjara. And he carved up all the gullies and all the valleys, all the mountains from all the area you see here. And the Mandanjara now sleeps in that Baliander. This is a place where that great spirit, the water spirit, is Umbra in the Balbara, which is that Baliander river. That's where all the life comes from the life source of all beings, all the wara, which kangaroo, all the gandalu, emu, all that come from this country here. And all the neighboring mobs, we all come together 
We celebrate that great water, the Mandanjara. And just as we paint ourselves with the white ochre, that represents water as well as spirit. And when we sing, it's the rhythm from that land. And it's in that time when we sing it, then we know we're connected. Our ancestors are there in the land of the Wangan and Jagalingu people. And this is the place of our dreaming. Our law we walk in is the native bee, which is the kaba. That is the, the law of our totemic beings. The most important thing is for us to maintain our cultural integrity. So there's been a big fight um, by the Wangan and Jangalingu peoples, and particularly that man that you saw in the imagery there, Adrian Burugaba. Uh, so a lot of litigation about that. I won't go uh, into it. Um, it involves disputes within the Wangan and Jangalingu peoples. Um, some members of um, the Wangan and Jangalingu peoples support the mine going ahead for the money that will be paid to them. Adrian Burugaba has been a leader saying, no, uh, we don't want your money, we don't want your mine, stay away. So there's been a massive fight by Adrian and, and others. Um, it's a complex story. Uh, I wanted to play you that short clip, though, because I, as a non-Aboriginal person, um, I don't want to speak about uh, their laws and customs, and I think that that clip is a great... Uh, snapshot of the sorts of issues that arise for them. Um, I just mentioned before um, finishing this topic that native title holders are not free to ignore general laws uh, such as for nature conservation but there are significant difficulties with regulating traditional hunting and uh, hunting of threatened species. So here's an image of um, a dugong that's been uh, hunted and has been taken back to a community for um, part of um, traditional hunting. Uh, so it's a, again a difficult area um, because a lot of threatened species like dugong and turtles have been made um, endangered by non-traditional owner practices, so fishing or, or other practices that have been done by Europeans. And now the um, traditional owners are not allowed to um, just practice their traditional rights. Um, because essentially, again, of impacts that they didn't cause. But it's a complex area, but the simple point that I'd make is they're not just free of the general laws. So to wrap up, um, this lecture started with water management laws, focused on the Paradise Dam um, and Murray-Darling, um, talked briefly about fisheries laws and talked very briefly about cultural heritage laws. Um, you can read more about the Water Act and the Fisheries Act in my synopsis book. The take-home points are these. Firstly, water management is difficult and complex. It's difficult both technically due to the highly variable flows of Australian rivers, and it's also really difficult politically. Second point, environmental regulation is very hard for long-term and highly complex environmental problems like yeah, water management. Um, monitoring can be important components of approvals, but are worthless if the results are ignored, like as what, what happened with Paradise Dam. Uh, there are important controls on water management, fisheries and cultural heritage uh, integrated into the development assist assessment system of the Planning Act. There's also um, important um, recognition of Indigenous cultural heritage and native title under other laws. And the final point is that native title holders are not free to ignore general laws, such as for nature conservation, but there's significant difficulties with regulating traditional hunting of threatened species.